babies grow at a rapid pace. By one year of life, their weight will approximately triple, while their length will increase by about 50%, and their head circumference by about a third. As the infant progresses through their first year of life, their physical growth will slow, and their gains in weight, length, and head circumference will decrease. During the first three months of life, babies gain on average 30 grams per day, 3.5 centimeters in length per month, and 2 centimeters per month in head circumference. Now it is important to keep in mind that the newborn may lose up to 10% of their weight following birth, but will normally regain it by the end of the second week. Between the third and sixth months, weight increases by about 20 grams per day, length by 2 centimeters per month, and head circumference by 1 centimeter per month. Between the sixth and ninth months, weight increases by about 15 grams per day, length by 1.5 centimeters per month, and head circumference by about half a centimeter per month. And between the 9th and 12th months, weight increases by about 12 grams per day, length by 1.2 centimeters per month, and head circumference still increases by about half a centimeter per month. Monitoring changes in these growth parameters is vital because appropriate growth is an indicator of health, while conversely, abnormal growth can result from several conditions or problems. Now this table applies to infants with growth parameters, such as weight, that were appropriate for gestational age at birth. Also keep in mind that there is great variability in these parameters amongst babies and whenever possible, specific growth curves should be used. As the infant progresses through their first year, their physical growth slows while their daily weight gain decreases. During the first three months of life, the average weight gain is about 30 grams per day and about 210 grams per week. Now keep in mind that the newborn may lose up to 10% of their weight following birth, but will normally regain it by the end of the second week. Between the third and sixth months of life, the average weight gain is about 20 grams per day and 140 grams per week. Between the sixth and ninth months of life, the average weight gain is about 15 grams per day and 105 grams per week. And between the ninth and 12th months of life, the average weight gain is about 12 grams per day and 84 grams per week. The decline in daily weight gain is gradual, that is, there isn't a market drop off at any point. So weight gain does not suddenly decrease from 30 grams a day to 20 at the 3 month mark. This table is a guide and there's a range of weight gain that would be considered adequate. So now the important question, how is this information helpful? Well, appropriate weight gain is an indicator of health, while conversely, aberrant weight gain can result from several conditions or problems. To help illustrate the significance of weight monitoring in infants, let's examine a sample case. TJ is a baby boy, born at term without complications, weighing 3,000 grams. At his two-month checkup, he was progressing well with a weight of 4,600 grams. He gained 1,600 grams since birth, which averages approximately 26 grams of weight gain per day, a satisfactory amount. When using birth weight to calculate the daily weight gain, consider that the initial weight loss that babies experience in the first few days of life will decrease the average to some extent. A later measurement will likely result in a more accurate average weight gain. At his three month checkup, he continued to progress well and his weight was measured to be 5,500 grams. He had thus gained 900 grams since the previous measurement, about 29s of weight gain per day in the preceding 31 days. TJ was brought back in by his parents later that month due to concerns regarding poor feeding. At this visit, 27 days later, his weight was found to be 5,900 grams. He gained only 400 grams, which equates to approximately 15 grams per day, a low amount that is concerning and should alert one to the possibility of an underlying problem. In this case, an explanation should be sought and prompt relevant evaluation or management. Now for a few general recommendations. For weight measurement, use a reliable scale that is calibrated regularly. Infants are preferably weighed while completely undressed, that is, without a diaper. If, however, a dry diaper is left on, then remember to subtract the weight of the diaper. 
which should be measured to the nearest gram and recorded in four digits. For example, 4,321 grams opposed to 4.3 kilograms. Mark each weight measurement on an appropriate growth chart with a dot, opposed to a circle, cross, or another shape. Most infants track along a growth percentile. If there's significant deviation, that is, crossing of two major percentile lines, then further assessment is warranted. As well, assess further whenever an infant's weight, weight for length, or BMI approaches or is less than the 5th percentile. Other parameters such as mid-arm circumference and weight as percentage of ideal are also helpful. And it is vital to never leave the infant unattended at any time. Babies grow at a rapid pace. Their birth length tends to increase by 50% by one year and doubles by the fourth year. Between 24 and 30 months of age, children reach approximately half of their adult height. So to get a rather rough projection of an infant's stature as an adult, you can just double their length at two years of age. During the first three months of life, babies increase in length by about three and a half centimeters per month. Between the third and sixth months of life, the average increase in length is about two centimeters per month. Between the sixth and ninth, increase in length is about one and a half centimeters per month. And between the ninth and twelfth, the average increase in length is about 1.2 centimeters per month. Monitoring linear growth is vital because appropriate growth is an indicator of health, while conversely, abnormal growth can result from several conditions or problems. Usage of correct technique is paramount when assessing linear growth in infants. Linear growth in infants is best monitored with sequential measurements of recumbent length. Utilize a length measuring board, such as an infantometer, instead of determining length via alternative methods that can provide inaccurate measurements. Ideally, two people should work together. One person maintains the infant's position while the other makes the measurement. The infant's head needs to be gently held erect against the headboard while the legs should be flat with the heels placed up against the footboard. Mark each length measurement on an appropriate growth chart with a dot, opposed to a circle, cross, or another shape. Always compare current measurements with previous ones and assess further if there is a significant deviation. Their head circumference tends to increase by up to one-third in the first year of life, and by four years of age, most head growth is already complete. During the first three months of life, head circumference increases by about two centimeters per month. Between the third and sixth months, the average increase in head circumference is about one centimeter per month. And between the sixth and twelfth months, it increases by about half a centimeter per month. Monitoring changes in head circumference is vital because appropriate growth is an indicator of health, while conversely, abnormal growth can result from several conditions or problems. Usage of correct technique is paramount when measuring head circumference in infants. Measure head circumference with a flexible but non-stretchable measuring tape. Measure the maximum occipital frontal circumference, that is, from the supraorbital ridge frontally to the external occipital protuberance posteriorly. Repeat the measurement three times and record the largest value. Mark each length measurement on an appropriate growth chart with a dot, opposed to a circle, cross, or another shape. Always compare current measurements with previous ones and assess further if there is a significant deviation. In the event of an abnormal result, it is also important to measure the circumference of each parent's head. Then assess whether or not the child's head circumference aligns with their measurements on their growth chart. The mid-parental height is a calculation based on parental stature that provides a crude estimate of a child's adult height. In males, add 13 centimeters to the sum of the parent's height and then divide by 2. While in females, subtract 13 centimeters from the sum of the parent's height and then divide by 2. 
the estimated adult height of the child is typically within a range of 8 cm above or below this value. It is this genetic target height range that is most useful. While not all siblings of the same sex reach the same height, their adult height usually falls within this range. Note that the calculation may not be as accurate when a parent is unusually short or tall. It is also not applicable when either fetal or postnatal growth has been permanently affected due to an illness or condition. The midparental height can similarly be calculated in inches. Now let's try an example. First, we will estimate the height potential of a boy named John. His mom is 170 centimeters tall. His dad is 175 centimeters tall. After entering these values into the equation for midparental height, we find that his target height is 179 centimeters. With a genetic target height range of 8 centimeters above or below this value, his adult height will likely be between 171 and 187 centimeters. Now let's estimate the height potential of a girl named Emma. Her mom is 172 centimeters tall. Her dad is 189 centimeters tall. After entering these values into the equation for midparental height, we find that her target height is 174 centimeters. With a genetic target height range of 8 centimeters above or below this value, her adult height will likely be between 166 and 182 centimeters. Failure to thrive should be considered when a child is less than the 5th percentile among children of the same sex and corrected age for weight, weight velocity, weight for length, length, or BMI. The diagnosis of failure to thrive may still be considered for children above the 5th percentile for the aforementioned growth parameters if their weight is less than 75% of median weight for age or length, or if two major percentile lines have been crossed in regard to weight for age or weight for length. Now keep in mind that a portion of healthy infants also cross two major percentile lines on the weight for age growth chart. Nonetheless, careful consideration of an underlying cause is warranted whenever one of these criteria are met. Other criteria, such as average daily weight gain, may also be taken into consideration. And I would also like to note that in premature infants, corrections for gestational age should be made for weight until two years of age.